Switzerland is a splendid nation of sublime views, beautiful architecture and wonderful people. Whether you happen to find yourself in Bern or Basel or simply just travelling around the country on the nation's roads. And this last picture of Interlaken, happily on the right of the image, has a building with the Swisscom logo imprinted on it, which neatly introduces us to the topic of today's video, which is Swisscom's radio access network and the spectrum and sites that they use. But first, here are some key facts about Swisscom. So they are a multiplay provider who provide fixed services, mobile services, television, as well as enterprise and various business services in the telecommunications sector as well. They have a mobile market share of approximately 60% and fixed line broadband connectivity at around 67%. This makes them the dominant provider. Swisscom used Ericsson as their sole radio access network equipment vendor, with Catherine providing the antennas. And they perform excellently in third party network benchmark tests like P3 and Ookla's speedtest.net. Understandably, given their market share and the quality of service offered, Swisscom operate with significant radio spectrum. So starting from low frequencies and working our way up, they have 2 by 10 megahertz of 800 megahertz, which is used entirely for 4G services for, with EARSEN 6300. Then 900 megahertz, is operated with 2 by 14.8 megahertz for 2G services and 3G. So they operate two downlink 3G carriers which are contiguous and have UAR FCNs 3050 and 3071. To the sides of these 3G carriers are the blocks for 2G. Next up is 1800 MHz, of which they have 2 by 30 MHz. This is then used for 4G at the very least on the first section of these spectral blocks for LTE carrier EARFCN 1301, which is their main 4G 1800 MHz spectrum at 2 by 20 MHz. Then on ultra urban sites, they then operate with additional 4G bandwidth on 1800 MHz. In the case of 2 by 10 MHz, with EAR FCN 1445. On high band only sites, this second set of 1800 MHz spectrum is used for 2G, but these are becoming few and far between. After the 1800 MHz, the next spectrum band is 2100 MHz, and they also own a large amount of this with 2 by 29.6 MHz, the majority of which is used for 4G services at 2 by 20 MHz with the EAR FCN 203. The remaining is used for 3G carriers, which once again are contiguous with. UAR FCNs 10713 and 10737. The final spectrum band that is deployed in use is 2 by 20 megahertz on 2600 megahertz for EAR FCN 3100. Swisscom also own 1 by 45 megahertz unpaired in 2600 megahertz which they could use for TDD, but at the time that I researched for this video, I could not find any evidence of it being in commercial use. Just a thing to note about the diagram and that unpaired 2600 MHz is it's existing in a different scale 
to the rest of the spectrum illustrated on this diagram. So how does all this spectrum that Swisscom have equate to what they deploy onto their mast sites? Well, Swisscom have effectively three different site spectrum configurations. The rural configuration, which contains just the, I say just, well, the, the base layer of spectrum, then your typical urban site, which has a little bit more, and ultra-urban with even more. So the base layer is 2D, 3D, 900 megahertz, 4G on 800 megahertz, the main 4G carrier on 1800 megahertz, and then all of the 2100 megahertz. So this equates to a whopping 2 by 50 megahertz of 4G spectrum, which is a massive amount. And why I said just in inverted commas earlier, because it is a massive amount of 4G and for that matter 3G spectrum as well, because don't forget that's still 4 downlink 3G carriers. Urban sites then get this base layer, and on top of that they then get the 2 by 20 megahertz of 2600 megahertz. And finally, ultra-urban sites get the additional 1800 megahertz 4G as well for a massive 2 by 80 megahertz of 4G spectrum. And you can see this is basically one of the reasons that they perform so well, because they have so much spectrum deployed across the country. Of course, there are other factors like excellent optimization as well, but that slightly goes outside the scope of this video. So now that we've covered the spectrum and background of Swisscom in Switzerland, let's now talk a bit about their mast sites. This is the first mast site that I will be talking about, which is an urban located one with all of the commercial spectrum bands present. At the top of the mast are dual low band catherine antennas, Underneath those are triple high band ones and below those are the Ericsson radio system remote radios for the high bands. Starting at the top of the mast, the dual low band catherine antennas are fed off diplexes located around them, which separate the diplex low bands from the feeds going up the mast into 800 and 900 to be fed into the separate ports on the dual low band catherine antennas. At the base of the mast where the equipment is located, the 800 and 900 megahertz will be diplexed from the radios to go up feeders to hit the diplexers then located by the antennas. And doing it this way reduces the number of feeders that have to climb the mast, which is important for the mast with a limited diameter where you can only fit a certain number of feeders inside and also from like a cable clutter point of view in terms of having a whole array of feeders on the outside of the mast, which can then impact on things like wind loading. The high band side of things is dealt with with the lower antennas, like I said, the triple band catherine antennas, and four out of the six ports on these are being used. And each of the Ericsson radio system remote radios, of which there are three for each sector, one for each of the high bands is 44R. And therefore each of the high band ports going to the Catherine antenna has 1800, 2100, 2600 triplexed together. A thing to know about this site and a lot of these urban sites is that while they use for transmit or receive capable Ericsson radio system remote radios, they don't actually operate in for transmit. They only radiate to transmit with for receive, so increased receive diversity over a conventional 2T2R system. And the reason they do not operate with for transmit is likely due to Switzerland's incredibly strict radio emission limits which would mean that operating with forward transmit would mean they would have to alter the coverage footprint from these sites in order to avoid exceeding the threshold regulatory limit for radio emissions. The next urban site is actually functionally almost identical, except this has fewer ports on the antenna side of things. So if we start off with the high band, they're using 
dual high band cathrine antennas instead of triple with spare ports. So these have four high band ports and once again each of those is fed from a triplexer which is connected up to the selection of remote radios for each of the high bands. So it's from a high band point of view identical except there aren't any spare ports on the antenna side of things really. On the low band side once again, the 800-900 MHz are diplexed at the radio side of things, but then they're not diplexed out at the antenna side. So the 800-900 MHz are fed diplexed together into single low band antennas. This is the final urban site that I will be talking about in this video. And from an antenna point of view, this is kind of a mix of the previous two setups. So there are dual high band cathrines on the top antenna stack and dual low band cathrines on the lower stack. So the dual low band antennas just have the 4800, 2D, 3D, 900 fed through separate feeders from the ground. So that's all very straightforward. The upper high band cathrines have the three high bands fed into them very much as before, so 1800, 2100 and 2600 megahertz. However, in this case, they are using dual band Ericsson radio system remote radios for the 1800 and 2100. So these remote radios, single remote radio, emits the 4G1800 and 3G4G 2100 megahertz out of a single box instead of having two. So that obviously greatly over the course of a three sector site reduces the amount of remote radios that are installed on the site. The 2600 megahertz is very much as before. And this basically just means that from now on the bands are combined using diplexers on each port. So there's the 1800 and 2100 into one of the diplexer ports and then the 2600 into the other of the diplexer ports for each of the diplexers feeding each of the high ports on those high band cathrine antennas at the top of the mast. So this is using very cutting edge dual band for transmit for receive 1800 and 2100 remote radios. Each of these urban sites have all of the commercially deployed spectrum bands on them as I said. In terms of the additional 1800 MHz 4G, that second pair 10 MHz carrier, that's a software refarm. So of these urban masts that don't already have it, when the loading becomes high, it's very easy for them to enable that additional carrier for the site to then effectively become an ultra urban capacity site example. Now that we've seen the urban sites and by virtue of the point I just made, ultra urban sites as well, now let's move on to the more rural site examples that I saw in Switzerland. Our first non-urban example is this two sector road serving site with hectoband cathine antennas and three ERS per sector. So a lot of spare antenna ports for certain and the schematic that I have come up with for this site has the 800 MHz, 1800 MHz and 2100 MHz on the Ericsson radio system remote radios and then 900 MHz coming from the ground fed through master amplifiers. The second non-urban site has antennas very similar to the first site that we saw. So triple band cathrine antennas in this case on top and dual low band cathrine antennas below. And there are no remote radios on this site but diplexes are visible. The 800-900 MHz are diplexed on the radio side and then diplexed out at the antenna side again to separate 800 900 ports on the antennas, on the low band antennas. And for the 1800 MHz and 2100 MHz it's the same, so they're diplexed on the ground and then diplexed out into separate ports. The next non-urban example is very much the same as the second site we saw, so the second urban site. 
antenna wise in that it has dual high band cathodic antennas and single low band ones. Now down to the layout of the equipment on this site it's not possible to say for certain which is remote radio and which is ground fed because on each level there are three remote radios. So on the top level, so the high band antennas, either 1800 or 2100 megahertz is from remote radio with the other band coming from the ground. Meanwhile, on the low band side of things, there's single low band antennas. So there are diplexes there and then either 800 or 900 is coming from the ground and the other coming from remote radio. Again, I'd be kind of tempted to put 900 megahertz on the ground and 800 megahertz are the lower set of remote radios. But for the upper set, I am not completely sure whether it's 1800 or 2100 megahertz, which is on those remote radios and which is coming from the ground. The mast also has mast amplifiers for the ground fed bands. So in the case of the high band, which is fed from the ground based radios, it will go through mast amplifiers before then going to the relevant ports on the antennas. Meanwhile, in the case of the low band, it will go from the radios to the relevant mast amplifiers and then into the diplexer where it will be diplexed with the band which is remote radio fed before it will then get fed to the antennas. The last of the typical non-urban sites features the same antennas as the last site except they're vertically inverted. The upper antennas are for low bands and have the mast amplifiers there and the lower ones are for the high bands, once again featuring mast amplifiers. So there are no Ericsson radio system remote radios pole mounted here. So top antennas being single low band, so 800 and 900 megahertz diplexed at the ground and then fed into the mast amplifiers near the antennas and then fed into the antennas. The high band side of things, that's just separately fed from the radios at the cabin and then there are mass amplifiers there for 1800 and for 2100. This next setup is a little bit more atypical. So it has dual band cathodic antennas except these have a single low band and a single high band each. With all the bands this is carrying that means that there will be diplexes on each of the bands. So the low band ports will have 800 megahertz and 900 megahertz diplex then the high band ports will have 1800 and 2100 megahertz diplexed. Due to the number of Ericsson remote radios on this pole I suspect three of the bands are remote radio fed and one is from the ground so I've done as before and I've put 900 megahertz on the ground going through mast amplifiers before then going into the diplexes where they'll it will get combined with the 800 megahertz off the remote radios and then fed into the low ports of the cathodic antennas. And in the case of the high bands, the 1800 and 2100 from the Ericsson remote radios then gets diplexed again in the diplexes before then going to the high ports. The final site that I'll talk about is one of the rare high band only sites. So this has no 800 or 900 megahertz on it but it still has 40 megahertz paired of 4G bandwidth, 20 megahertz paired from the 1800 megahertz and 20 megahertz paired from the 2100 megahertz. The remaining 1800 megahertz spectrum is used for 2G and the 3G is to downlink carriers through 2100 megahertz. So by not having low band, it does end up with significantly reduced bandwidth overall However, Swisscom have cross E node B aggregation, so even if you connect to one of these, you'll still get triple carrier aggregation because you'll get the other you'll get another carrier from a neighbouring site, which is very, very nice. The site uses dual band cathodic antennas and mast amplifiers on each of the high bands, so once again, a quite straightforward site.
with these sites where the radios are not visible for 1800 and 2100 MHz, I've put Ericsson radio systems at ERS down the schematics because I feel this is the most likely. Thanks for watching this video about Swisscom's macro site in Switzerland. Due to the length of the video, this will have to be just that for now, i.e. the macro sites. I will do another video about their microcells and small cells at another time because this is over 20 minutes long by this point. Um, so thanks again and I hope to see you on the next video.